So what'd you think? <laughs> my, for my opinion, I'm Frank Rabbis, by the way. Uh, nice to meet you all. This is my 15th year uh, coming to SCAD. Uh, it is the 25th year of the SCAD Savannah Film Festival. And it's the 40th anniversary of Blade Runner. So we have a really special group of people here to talk to you tonight about Blade Runner, about Blade Runner The Final Cut, and about some stories, because I want to focus this on some stuff that you probably haven't heard, about some stories uh, uh, that, that uh, Blade Runner, uh, had, that have become mythical in the ideology of Blade Runner. So, let's start off with this young lady, first of all. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you Joanna Cassidy, Zora. Zora. That was some outfit. Wasn't it? Paste it on, took five hours. That was some snake. And it was mine. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that uh, that Joanna uh, had to go through when she made that scene in that movie and what Ridley wanted, and then what had to happen when this movie was remade as the final cut. Let's introduce the man who was producer of the restoration of Final Cut and the director of Dangerous Days, Charles Dolazarica. Come on out, Charlie. So what was it like to work with Joanna? On? Go ahead. You're on. Should we do this now? No, let's, no, do, no, it. No. let's do it later when we got the... Well, just, just a quick little... It was great. It was a lovely... Good. That's an uh, <laughs> <laughs> Next up, I'd like to bring out the guy responsible for the costumes. Boy, if, if that shot of, uh, of uh, Rachel coming in the first time you saw her in the Tyrell building didn't make you just go, ah. Well, then you're not my age. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Michael Kaplan, the costume coordinator, creator for Blade Runner. So I, I just have a quick question for you. What was it like to work with Joanna? <laughs> so uh, this young man won the BAFTA award for these costumes. How about that? <laughs> And last but not least, the guy who was the Oscar-nominated art director, think about this, the art director of that entire world, Mr. David L. Snyder. <laughs> right? Got a lot of human disciplines here. You've got a star, you've got a producer, you've got a costume guy, you've got an art director guy, what more could you want, huh? Ladies and gentlemen, these are the people that made Blade Runner. So I'm going to, sorry I walked right in front of you. Let's talk for a minute about... Would you like me to move down the No, I'd like you to sit right here, because I'm going to move around. I'm going to okay. build Donnie. All right. You guys remember him? So tell me a little bit about that scene, running through the glass. That is the scene that may be the most iconic scene in the whole movie. What's the story behind that? Well, they, you know, I came on at the end of the film, the very end of the film, and uh, so there were only a couple weeks left before they were going to have to call it quits, and there was a strike coming up, there was a lot of money being spent, and, and Zorro was at the end. So I had to make my whole thing happen very quickly. Um, <clears throat> they had a stunt woman that was going to uh, go through the glass for me because it would just be too costly to have the actor go through because even though it's candy glass, I could have been cut, um, which I actually was a little bit, but um, 
Anyway, it always bothered me that it wasn't me and I could see that it was a stunt person because I, I, it was a bad wig. <laughs> and uh, so 25 years later, I uh, still had the costume and still fit in it. And I, I redid the scene. So they, uh, it, was, it was an interesting process. But so we're, we're gonna talk to Charles in a minute about that scene and how it was remade for the 21st century. But uh, what I'm curious <laughs> also about, Joanna, is when you went to get this role as an actress, um, how did it get pitched to you, and what did you do to get it? Well, I, a couple things. First of all, I didn't say thank you to everybody for being here. This is really great that you came out to see this film. <laughs> support it and your followers and it's one of the favorite pieces, my favorite pieces that I've done. But uh, in answering the question, my agent brought me the, the script and said that he had told Lily Scott that I'm the only person in town to play it because I'm the only person who has a snake. <laughs> so when I met with Ridley. Wait, wait you, you had your own person. It was my snake. That, that, that was your snake? Mm -hmm. And he was very good. He got paid. <laughs> Do you still get residuals for the snake? No. Uh, no, it was a buyout. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm in, in those days, you could meet with someone, with a director, and you didn't have to go through all these channels and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and, you know, all the steps, the casting of producers, the director, blah, 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 blah. And we had dinner, and I talked to him about it. I read with him. And he was Partner. Ridley. 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 And um, as I called him, a couple days went by and he called my agent and he said, Okay, you've got the job. I'll take it. Well, that's historic because I, one of the things I was going to say when I came out here was I, I, I always try and look at the top five movies ever made. This movie is in that top five to me. So let's talk a little bit to you, Charles. Charlie. And I'm going to give you the clicker while we do this to talk a bit about. What did you have to do uh, for the final cut version of this movie? Which, and also go through a little bit with me about what it was that Ridley didn't like about the original movie and what you ended up with that he did like. Well, I mean, kind of famously, uh, if you know the history of Blade Runner, there are multiple versions of the film. There's like no less than five, perhaps even more versions of the film out there. And uh, mostly that had to do with that the financiers of the original film uh, and Ridley clashed quite a bit creatively. So the cut that came out in theaters in 1982 was not Ridley's true cut, like some cut of the film that he really was behind. And then home video, there was another cut called the International Cut, which had a little bit more violence in it, and um, that was not Ridley's cut. Then they found for a 70 millimeter film festival in LA, a lost 70 print of the film, and anyone who gets up first thing on Saturday morning to watch Blade Runner knows immediately, like it's a totally different opening, totally different logos at the beginning, it's, it's, it's just and, a- And of course, a different ending, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, the, one of many things, but that, that's still not the, the journey that we're, we're on yet. But that cut got out, so people are starting to question, oh, there's another cut of Blade Runner out there. So that led to the 1992 director's cut, which also Ridley couldn't do because he was off, he was finishing Thelma Louise, he was going off to do 1492, so he couldn't supervise that. So that wasn't his cut. So finally, <laughs> for, for the 25th anniversary in 2007, we got to do Ridley's true final cut of the film. And that meant going in and just correcting a lot of edits and, and kind of continuity problems. One of the biggest of which is Joanna's, uh, Zora's death scene, where, as she mentioned, Lee Pulford, the stunt performer, uh, is obviously not Joanna. So let me see, so like basically, this is what you saw uh, in the movie tonight, basically. This is from the final cut. And it, this is kind of like a, uh, <laughs> this is what it's been like since 2007, but before that, it was that. <laughs> so that's Lee Pulford in the bad wig. And so as you see, there's four other versions of the film that have this version of Zora's death. So, uh, Joanna and I got to talking when I interviewed her for Dangerous Days for my documentary, and we were basically saying, let's just do it. Let's just, you know, try to fix it. And we talked to Ridley, and he was kind of like, eh, maybe, I don't know. Try it. So we tried it, and with Warner Brothers' generosity and Sony Picture Imageworks visual effects team there, we set out to put Joanna 
in that scene because she was not there originally. So. It's persistence. Yes. Persistence in age. April 13, 2007, Los Angeles. Joanna returned as Zora. So 25 years after she did it the first time, she came back looking just as great. And here she is being put in hair and makeup in a much better way. <laughs> that really looks much more convincing that's really her. Um, even to the point of like putting like the snake tattoo on your neck and everything, it was really a lot of work like went, in, went into this. So this is her on the set at the New Deal Studios. Um, and that's the original top, right? The Zora costume, Michael, right? Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> and uh, so, so Joanna just sat there in the green screen, but she was directed uh, by Rich Hoover over here to uh, you know move around, and I mean you could probably describe, describe it better than I could, but you were just basically mimicking Lee's movies. Right, I did, well it was in bits and pieces, and then the one, the tumble that she takes. Mm -hmm. I, I was on my feet for that one, was I not? Uh, I mean you were sitting the whole time, but they, man, they managed oh. to move your head around. You're just doing things, like you're doing crazy things. You're just like, <laughs> she looked like you're in a, like a flight simulator. Tilt -tool. Yeah, and uh, so anyway, but they managed to get every angle of your face. Yeah. And, uh, and and put you in the film. So that's kind of the, the before, and you can't really see it down here because it's lit, but that was amazing. And it wasn't just the shot, it's the entire scene where Lee Helford was you know, obviously not Joanna that we, uh, we went in and fixed. And so now it's Joanna. And as, as Lee did that, she had one take, and she did that. They started putting her makeup on and wig at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, wait a minute. One take for the original shot. For the original yeah. shot, yes. Right. How um, many cameras? And she... Must have been. Oh, I, I, I think... Yeah. Not, not as many as you have to... You were there, David. How many cameras were there for that shot? Yeah. <laughs> not well, as many as you think. Actually. As many as you think there were. At... Well, I know, but for the end shot, you know, where I... Put, where, at the very end, I, the bullet goes through, and then you know, the blood goes. I had a squib in my, or, a, you know, the button in my hand, and that was a one-take deal. I had to hit a mark, press the button, cameras were all rolling, and that was one take, because the costume was pretty much demolished. I mean, we had two, two, two Well, I, I actually thought that the, the idea of the, of the, the see-through costume and the, the, the way that the blood stayed inside of it was really the costume design. It was really something. Um, so there's about a hundred picture changes from the previous cuts of Blade Runner to the final cut. A lot of them are really hard to spot, and you're not supposed to spot them. That's the whole point. You're not supposed to be taken out of the movie to say, oh, that's a special effect, that's a change, that's a fix. So we tried to make it as invisible as possible. But one of my favorite fixes that came up as we were discussing Joanna's scene was uh, this scene, which is kind of hard to see here, but this is when um, Deckard goes to visit Abdul Ben Hassan, the snake dealer. And um, for, again, for years and years, for 25 years, the dialogue is massively out of sync with the, with the lip movement in the scene. If you were to watch any of those other cuts, Harrison Ford is like, like that. And he's like, what's happening? And you're hearing like this dialogue completely from like another dimension that does not line up at all with what you're seeing. And again, that takes you out of the film. You're like, what's, I don't even know what's happening. I don't know, I don't know where this voice is coming from. So, uh, when we were talking about replacing Joanna's face and head onto Lee's body, we thought, well, what else could we do? Um, so, in fixing this, we went to this guy. Not, that's me 15 years ago, not that guy. This guy, yeah. This guy, I don't know if you recognize him. That's Ben Ford, Harrison Ford's son. Now, Ben owned a restaurant a couple blocks away from Sony Pictures and Image Works, where we were working on the effects. And a friend of his who worked there basically said, well, you know, Ben Ford's a friend of mine. Let's go ask him. So basically left a note for Ben, and he said yes. And he came in, because we're not going to get Harrison to come in for, like, you know, what we were doing. So Ben came in, and uh, interestingly, he's the exact same age, same age when we did this as Harrison was when he made Blade Runner. So it lined up very well. And again, one of my favorite bits here is, you know, Harrison Ford has a very trademark scar on his chin. Applying the scar to, to young Ben was, was really a lot of fun, very geeky. Um, but yeah, it's kind of hard to see here because of the light, but we have the rough composite, the final composite. You can get a sense of basically everything from the nose down in this scene now is Ben Ford and the rest of it's Harrison Ford. Um, and now the scene is in sync, the dialogue lines up, and it's, it doesn't take you out of the movie like you used to. 
think it's interesting that, uh, you know, this movie was made at a time when uh, CG was not the big deal. This movie was made pretty old school. A lot of matte paintings, a lot of real locations. Uh, there's some great location stories about with David and, uh, and Ridley, which we'll get to in a second, but let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the costume designs for this movie. Originally, uh, this movie, uh, as I understand it, was considered, uh, it's, is it sci-fi, not noir? Uh, it was, it was, it was a, a dark uh, procedural murder mystery type of, a, type of a story. It almost felt like originally, uh, like, uh, like an old black and white detective movie with the narration, which was Harrison's narration. A lot of that changed. The point I'm making is that it's original old school filmmaking that was not old school in bringing it back to the 21st century. Anyway, that's not a point. Point is, tell me a little bit about the costume decision making process that you went through. I mean, that moment when Rachel walked into the room in that black dress was an astounding moment and iconic for this film. And I hand it to you for taking that look. How come? Well, the entire look of the costumes uh, was uh, a take that I uh, had gotten. I guess it was the reason I got the job. Ridley had uh, brought Charles Node over, who he wanted to do the costumes, and Charles was used to working with a partner, and they weren't going to bring Charles's uh, London partner over. Uh, they said they wanted to hire somebody in America who also knew the ropes in California. Uh, Ridley interviewed a lot of people uh, in the Union, and uh, their take on the science fiction uh, genre was pretty old fashioned. They talked to him about, you know, like silver modeler spacesuits and, and a lot of things that, you know, were not uh, uh, what, what he was expecting, you know, uh, the film to look like. When he spoke to me, I read it and uh, I really saw it as an old Humphrey Bogart movie that just happened to be in the future. And so that was my take. And, um, you know, that's what Ridley and I discussed and, and that's what he had in mind. And I guess that's, that's why I got the job. Uh, Show us some of the drawings that you, uh, that you the process that you went through. Um, there was, a, there was a designer, uh, I'm not quite sure where they are in terms of uh, order. Uh, that's me uh, in 1980. So when, when, did you, when did you start uh, conceiving uh, the costume designs for this film, the film was released in 82? We had a lot of time. I think that's why we were able to do so much detail. Uh, Filmways was having financial problems uh, at the time. And the film almost didn't get made. And uh, they shut down. And Ridley had to find other financing. Uh, he decided not to lay off uh, the art department and the costume department. And I think we got half pay. Uh, during this period, but it added a lot of time where we could continue working and uh, a lot of time that we wouldn't have normally had, which gave us uh, uh, a lot more time for research, for actually making the clothes, uh, for, uh, you know, thinking up all the details for each character, and uh, I think that enriched the look of the film so much, so it was... Um, uh, almost a blessing uh, that, that they went through this uh, financial hardship. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever heard that before. <laughs> yeah, we had, we had months of, uh, you know, uh, time to, to just function, you know, the two departments, costumes and, and production design, that we would not have had otherwise. Uh, well, you, you also had to talk, uh, had to to dress people that were living in that dystopian world in Los Angeles. You had other characters that you had to dress. Deckard looked so, so much like a 1940 with that long trench coat. I mean, I can remember that shot where he had his collar up as he was walking into the bar and he brings it down to 
was such a, to me, a, a, a costume moment. I thought it was really good. Um, so the it process. Was, it was futurizing uh, the, the Humphrey Bogart genre of, of you know, 1940s films, uh, them fatales, and, and yet, uh, you know, doing things where it didn't look like a 1940s film, but still stayed within that kind of realm. And um, uh, taking some futuristic ele elements and putting them into the clothes. Uh, during the 40s, uh, women wore uh, large shoulder pads, but instead of doing the same shape shoulder pads, we did large shoulder pads with a different shape. So uh, we always corrected ourselves from, from uh, you know, making it into a 1940s film. Um, well, did you have, um, did you have times where you had to, you know, pull teeth to get something done that you wanted to get done? Or, or was it your creations happened in exact sync with the director at all times? Uh, no, no, you know, Ridley is definitely somebody who has, uh, you know, a point of view. And oftentimes he said, no, you, you know, you guys are all face. Uh, mm. uh, but what were you showing him? That's not what I was thinking. Were you showing him drawings? We were showing him drawings, yes, yes. And sometimes we'd inspire him, but usually he would come down during this period uh, when uh, we were like a skeleton crew, and he'd uh, keep us going by doing a few little uh, thumbnail sketches, a couple of which I still have. So he would draw them himself. Why don't you go forward? Because I know there's a couple of others. He would draw beautifully and uh, inspire us for weeks. This is Charles Snow, my co-designer, uh, who has since retired, unfortunately. Uh, he became disillusioned with uh, show business and decided he didn't want to work anymore. But he's, he's after, after. Not after this movie, he continued working. For, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Disillusioned with show business. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> don't let that happen to you. But it's genius. Sketch and the finished costume. Um, How for heavy Rachel, her, her coat, obviously. Uh, I was not in the movie. That was uh, <laughs> just a quick shot on set. So that's a look at the uh, shoulder pads and how they fit with. You know, it, it, it struck me. There were more than there was more than the forties that you were looking at in this movie. I thought you you were looking at the twenty first century because the movie is set in twenty nineteen. So obviously we don't have flying cars yet, so not everything was uh, foretold in this movie. Um, but you've got the twenty first century. You've got cars from the seventies. I saw in there. I saw a beetle in there. Was that yours? Uh, mine. <laughs> some somebody had done this. You had taken some old cars and rebuilt them. Uh, to, to, so you have a lot of eras in all, there. All the cars in the movie were, were uh, built on onto uh, small uh, cars of that time. So I actually donated my my beetle. That was your beetle. Yes, but it wasn't a beetle in the movie. It was it was uh, transformed into a futuristic looking car that didn't look anything like a beetle. Uh, but. Well, the, the point that I was getting at, though, was that the movie itself sort of shows all of these different eras, whether it's the, the you know, the, the buildings that were built down in, in that part of Los Angeles that you show the exteriors of, to the characters in the, uh, in the streets, to the stars of the movie themselves, all of these different eras, they all kind of work together. How, how did you, did you preconceive that those multiple eras would work together, or did it just happen? I think it was just, uh, we worked instinctually. Uh, a lot of the patterns and fabrics uh, had a geometry, and that was because uh, the first location that uh, Ridley decided he wanted to use was Union Station. And Charles and I went down to Union Station to do a little exploration, and uh, there were uh, Mexican deco tiles that had these interesting patterns, and so we tried to Put those patterns, uh, as you can see on some of these designs that I did, um, uh, we, we tried to uh, make that uh, cohesive with the, uh, the, the sets that were going to be, uh, you know, uh, that 
background. So I, I, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm, I'm going to. So you, you went on to do uh, work on Star Wars and on uh, Star Trek. You did some amazing work. Did any of what you did in, in this movie, did any of that enter your brain as you were doing those other science fiction films? Process, you know, uh, just how how you can go about uh, thinking about the future. Uh, nobody knows what it's going to look like. Uh, fashion, you know, uh, takes its own course. Uh, but uh, to try to do it uh, intelligently, you know, there there was a way to kind of construct another society, which we did here, and so. Uh, I don't think I ever thought about it as, you know, using Blade Runner as a takeoff point, but the process right. of, of how I worked uh, and, and how I worked, uh, you know, in, in thinking about it uh, was at hand. So one final uh, question before we go on to David. And I want to ask you, looking back now and looking at today, which is when that movie was portrayed, portrayed today, did you ever think in your own mind, what are those clothes actually going to look like in 2019? Or it was, this is the world I'm going to create, and that's the way it is. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think about how they would look in the future. Uh, no. So what do you think of today's clothing? <laughs> yeah. Excuse me? What do you think of today's styles? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think about fashion. I don't really follow fashion. No, no. Uh, but you, that's why I like doing costume design because you're you're just dealing with the script and uh, its dictations and how to make the characters come alive in a perfect way. Uh, and uh, I mean, the film looks the way it looks because we had an incredible leader in Ridley. Uh, I've often worked with uh, directors who say, you know. I don't know that much about clothes, it just takes all the run with it, mm. which really terrifies me, uh, because you know he's saying that to every department head, and so the movie is not gonna have a cohesive look, cohesive look. Except he, he as a director has that cohesive look in his brain. He knows what he wants. Yes, yes, and yeah. so he we're feeding him ideas. Style. He wanted style, and that sort of half, you know, 40s looking style was, was beautiful. Yeah. That's how those people were shaped at the time. You know, movie stars at the time had a look, and they were disciplined, and they were trained to have, I mean, in a way, those kinds of bodies, which made it um, an easier thing to style beautiful clothes on. Um, and it, it was just a, you could really make a shape there. Right. I, th I think that today's, clothing, uh, and we were at the school, and we saw some phenomenal uh, designers. At, at the museum. Yeah, at the yes. museum. Oh my gosh. Very impressive. Incredible fashion ideas. And the, these guys are real fans of the school, and uh, I think that that's deserving, because you, you kids are the future of this industry. There's no doubt about yep. that. Yeah, Thanks. we had a tour yesterday, yep. and we're totally blown away by what you have at hand here, and uh, it's, it's Boggles the mind. Uh, I had no idea that all of this was going on here in Savannah. So impressive. So we're gonna pop, yes, really quick. Let me just show you something. Let me hit the, the clicker. Going to your question about you know fashion in 2022 versus there was a really great meme in October of 2019 that had basically these types of Im images saying, next month we start dressing like this. <laughs> And I was really kind of hoping we'd get there, but we didn't quite. That's, that's good. Those, those, by the way, the, the, the hats that were worn by the uh, Asian guys riding the bicycles that look like they're baskets from Pier 1. They were baskets from Pier 1. Um, Let me just say, years ago, um, uh, McQueen did a collection based on, uh, Star, uh, on Blade Runner. And uh, it was featured on the cover of uh, Italian Vogue. And I thought there were actual shots from Blade Runner, the way it was styled. Uh, so, uh, how did that line do? It kind of repeated itself. 
How did that line do? So David L. Snyder, who helped to create the world uh, of, uh, of Blade Runner, there's some great stories, David, that you've told me I'd love to, to have you talk to the kids about, uh, and the non-kids, uh, about the um, working with Ridley and finding those locations and some of the interesting things that happen as a result of that. Well, I'll let you do the clicking because I can't see what's behind it. Awkward. You talk. When I, uh, when I came on to the project, it was in the mid-1980, mid and uh, there had been an idea in the conceptual world where it was Mobius and, and Sid Mead who designed not only their vehicles, all the vehicles that were contemporary, 2019, but also uh, he painted some backgrounds that were sort of influencing it. But when it got down to the real deal where you can't shoot the painting and the drawings that were research material, Ridley and myself and Jordan Krenowitz, the director of photography, uh, on a Friday night went to downtown Los Angeles where Ridley may have been in past times, but this is his first movie in the United States, let alone Los Angeles. So uh, we made a list of all the buildings that we had arranged to go to, and as we walked down the street, uh, of course, we found the Bradbury building and that was a buy instantly. And so uh, there's a scene that you've just seen in the film where Harrison Ford's character, Rick Decker, and, and uh, Rutger Hauer character, Batty, have to jump between the two buildings. So I took him to a, a famous building in downtown LA called the Million Dollar Theater. And uh, we went up on the roof. The building had built in, was built in 1912. And so uh, we went up on the roof and we looked across and it was a, like a 12 foot span in the alley between the two buildings. And I said to Ridley, this looks kind of dangerous to me. I, I think from my point of view, maybe if we put a net in between, then it, it could be safe. And like the childlike character he was at times, he said to me, well, what if we see the net? I want to see the net. So I hired a, a civil engineer who came in and did a study. And uh, because of the, uh, the, the structure was built in 1912, he said, in order to take the entire crew up on the roof of this building, uh, you're going to have to build a subfloor over the entire roof to snowshoe affect everything. Otherwise, it's not safe. So we got back to the studio that night and I was in the elevator with uh, Ridley Scott and Ivor Powell, who was the associate producer. And I said to Ridley, you know, I mean, this is only my third film and so I'm trying to figure out. And, and of course, I'm talking to a, a famed art director in the past, Ridley Scott from BBC. He could draw better than anyone. His ideas were the best. And I said, you know, Shooting that scene with guys jumping and it kind of, kind of scares me. And he said, what do you mean it scares you? He said, it's my head that's on a chopping block. What worried about you? And so I went to Mike Wait Healy. Minute. His head was on the chopping block before somebody fell? <laughs> that's exactly right. And so I, I proposed building a structure uh, that was 20 feet high and 20 feet wide and 20 feet deep. Uh, to match the uh, million dollar building or the Rosalind Hotel as it's known. And because of the costs of doing that and because uh, of the ability to have that structure mobile where we can move it around, it really changed the concept of the stunt work and everything else. So also during that night, we came to a conclusion in Ridley's view of downtown Broadway in, in LA, he said, you know, I see 1920, I see 1940, I see 1960, I see today 1980, and what if we go into the future into 2020, which it was at the time. And so that idea of stratifying the architecture, the back lot of Warner Brothers, which was also built in 1924, I said, 
Okay, that's it. So <clears throat> we took the 1924 back lot that had been used in different eras, and we said, okay, we start with this. And then we'll put a, a layer of 1940, 1960, 1980. It, it was brilliant. It, stratification, because that's the way the real world is. But because it's in the future, and it's not so nice for everyone, or kind of today, for everyone. He said, uh, I want to retrofit all of the public utilities onto the building, and that means all the electrical, public power, and water, and gasoline had to be retrofitted or fit onto the structure because they were built so long ago and they were at masonry construction, you'd have to just about demolish the building to put all the new utilities in. And then the next trick we used to put in the public is that we uh, decided that there would never be a shot in the daytime, it would only be at night, and there would be a layer of rain, whether we were on stage or otherwise, as a layer in between, like sort of like a screen. Uh, and so once we got to the back lot, the bonus was the building that I had constructed was uh, movable, and that meant that there was no real sense of geography, and the streets being as short as they were on the back lot, if you look at the film, which you just did, you can see that it almost goes on to infinity. You really can't see the end of anything with all the matte paintings and the miniatures. Was that forced perspective or was it actual size? It, it was an all actual size. There was no, no forced perspective. That was Bill and Ted. That was another movie. So in any case... Uh, and, uh, by the way, if you all saw the Pee Wee movies, this guy. Yeah, yeah and that. And all in the same, by the way, all, all in the same place, all in one of them. So uh, the thing was that uh, we got there and the, the seminal thing is once we got there, it was time to shoot the jumps. That's my point I'm trying to make. So I had the stunt coordinator, Gary Combs, came to me with Richter Howard's double and he said, you have to do, uh, you have to do something for me. And I said, what's that? He said, the distance between the permanent set and the set that you Instructed for us, it's too far, the stunt guy won't jump. It's too far. By the way, this is like, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning, whatever. So I get my crew and we start moving this 800 cubic meter building little by little by little by little. And then really, shut up Michael Daly and he says, What are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm moving a building. He said, what are you doing that for? I said, because the, the stunt guy says his Ricker Howard guy, he can't make the jump. And he said, that ain't no stunt. Move it back. I said, <laughs> okay. So then, so we start, start moving it back. And then Ricker Howard, fabulous Ricker Howard comes over to me. He said, what's going on here? I don't know, I gotta move the building this way, I gotta move it that way, and Ridley doesn't wanna do it that way. And he said, well, let's go talk to him. So Rutger and I, in his uniform of trunks, uh, walked over to the camera and uh, he said to Ridley, uh, hey, you know, uh, if you are putting it back and the guy doesn't wanna do the stunt, then where are you gonna find the guy at two o'clock in the morning? Rutger Howard, Rutger Howard said, I'll do it. And I said, you will? And he said, yes. So we got up there and we're getting ready to shoot. And Libby said, uh, hey, listen, you know what? It, it, it looks kind of static up there. I, I need stuff moving, 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 moving. And he said, what about those fans that we used in the opening scene in the Holden uh, interview? And I said, well, you blew all that stuff up. It's all done. Everything is blown up by that show. Walls, fans. So uh, I went into the stage of where uh, Sebastian Department was, and I noticed that the grips came up with this ingenious idea to simulate a strobe light. And they had a bicycle wheel with little pieces of uh, styrofoam uh, and into a, a circle, and they would practically, you know, no CGI, they would spin it and put a light on it, and the scene would strobe. 
And it was really quite ingenious. So I got my prop master uh, at, I don't know, 2.30 in the morning. And we went around the lot and uh, we stole the wheels off bicycles, off carts, <laughs> and anything we can steal. I think there's an image of that somewhere. And uh, we went and cut out these sections of uh, styrofoam. And then I went to the catering guy and got a stack of paper plates. And I took the paper plates and we stapled them to the fans. And I got the grips to give me some C-stands. And we mounted them and we put some Nern flex, which we call, you know, the tube that looks like it's sort of serpentine. And uh, if you when, you, when you see the movie, which you already had, you'll see that the fans are in nearly all of the scenes at the end of the movie, and at six o'clock that night, they weren't there. So it was the kind of thing that Ridley would say, okay, do something, and I'd say, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, hey, you're the art director. You know, and it, and it was the same thing with, with Joanna's run through the glass. There's three or four nights between there where he would come and look at the setting where Joanna was going to run through it. He said, no, I don't, I don't like to do something else. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, you're the art director, so figure it out. So on the third night, second night, before we shot, he said to me, okay, so did you come up with something yet? It's just, you know, it's just, just four windows, can't you think of anything? I said, okay, how about fall, winter, spring, summer? And he said, was that so hard? So then I got my set decorator, four-time Academy Award nominated Linda DeSena, who I must mention, and she went and dressed, put all the mannequins in. We had a snow machine in one window. We had leaves blowing in another window. And the whole thing was set up, you know, in less than 24 hours. So a lot of things that you see in this film were not the way they were designed, drawn up, manufactured every single day with the brilliance of Ridley Scott. We changed everything, turned things upside down, built things for one purpose that were used for another purpose, and so I wish I could see the movie that you did because I see all the things that are missing and all the things that we never shot and all the things that were changed. So, it, it, it was and, and then, of course, you and the team, Oscar nominations. Oh, yes, yes. There was that. I, I just but I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into the uh, works for the guys in the back. I'm going to ask if you have any questions. So come down here quickly uh, to this microphone. First person that comes down gets a prize. Who's coming? You? Here you go. I don't have a prize, I lied. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I'm going to blow Joanna's mind. Bobby Lipton's voice came to me this morning. Bobby Lipton, and said to tell you that he loves you. Oh my, that is so special. Thank you. We'll have to talk after the... <laughs> That's wonderful. Hey, I have a question. First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude for one of my favorite movies. Thank you so much for all you guys have done to work on films in general, but especially on this movie. So I have a question about the costumes specifically. Um, they're beautiful and gorgeous, and I'm curious how much texture played a part in your decision making. Because Deckard's coat, I know it looks like raw silk, and there's a lot of kind of texture that plays throughout the film. It's just gorgeous and beautiful and plays well. So I was just curious, what was your uh, take on that, your strategy? I love texture. I always have. Uh, uh, since Blade Runner, which was very early on in my career. And um, uh, texture is very important. You don't know how it's going to be lit, and you don't want to lose things. And if there's texture there, there's something you know to pick up whatever light there it is. And um, uh, I love texture on texture. It just kind of, you know, adds interest. So thank you very much for saying that, and it, it actually was a raw silk jacket, and um, uh, and I think because of the texture, you can actually feel that, um, which uh, you know brings the viewers in even more. One more, one last one over here. Is Decker a replicant? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs>
for being with us today for the 40th anniversary of Blade Runner. Thank you to Zora, Joanna Cassidy. Thank you to Charlie Barbarica, Blade Producer Director. Thank you to Mike Catlin, brilliant costume designer, David Alzheimer, one of the absolute best in the business art directors. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chad.